Incidentally, let's uh, wish them all well. This is their day. I heard a little story not long ago to the effect that someone asked the gentleman, did you get any cards on Father's Day? He said, yes, I got them. Most of them were bills from Mother's Day. <laughs> Happy Father's Day, anyway. This morning we have an interesting and I think valuable subject, and that is the importance of experience from living, being properly remembered. Pythagoras of Samos was the one who introduced the discipline of remembering, uh, the uh, retrospective exercise in which the individual periodically, if possible daily, went back over the records of the day to find out what he had learned, what experience had done for him or to him. Now most persons are not very good at working with this nowadays because of lack of self-discipline and because of our peculiar mental complexes at the moment we can very carefully eliminate the important message from anything that happens to us. If it interferes with our pleasures, if it is inconsistent with our passing moods, we promptly forget it. We do not gain the important lesson that comes to those who remember well their own attitudes, their own mistakes, their own relationships with life, and what they have learned from these episodes and interludes. So to the Pythagorean theory can be added a problem of building a proper record of ourselves, building a proper consecutive account of our own daily experiences. Years ago, young people used to keep diaries. And I think the Pythagorean discipline has to do with the idea of a daily recording, not only of the things that happen to us, but what we do about them, how we try to solve the different situations that arise. Also, in the course of time, this type of discipline reminds us of a number of, in, of invaluable hints one of which is the tendency that most of us have of passing opinion on subjects with which we are not well informed. If we have this exercise and we have a false opinion about a certain subject and we discover our mistake, then this should be duly recorded for future record and evidence. And if we make the same type of mistake two or three times, then it is time for us to sit down and analyze our own attitudes on those subjects wherein we are at fault. Now, it's very easy to make this kind of a mistake in which we simply pass judgment and uh, assume that we are right, and then we have to wait for the consequences. Now, the consequences may not affect us personally, we may only realize that we took the wrong stand at a certain moment. But the tendency to take this wrong position should be remembered because it is evidence of characteristics within ourselves. The only way we can really learn the functions of our own minds and emotions is to record the consequences of attitudes. The moment we express some attitude, we set an action in motion. And Pythagoras believed that all incidents are in motion. The individual who starts something must live with it to the bitter end in some way. Now, there are many things that we do not need to record particularly. But we can, by careful noting and writing down our attitudes, gradually force ourselves to face ourselves. And this is very important. The, the average daily occurrence that is n normal in the affairs of living, do, these do not need to be recorded. But any unusual attitude of our own, any unusual attitude we take to other people, 
we have a right to put it down and say to ourselves, why did I hold that attitude? Why did I react in this particular way? Was it wise? Was it unwise? Today, of course, people are not much interested in whether it's wise or unwise. They want to do what they please. But as a result of disciplining these situations, the person can advance in his own unfoldment uh, with the very important phase of self-discipline. Today there are a great many religious organizations that have various esoteric exercises and meditations and prayers and all kinds of affirmations in relationship to daily living. But up to now, the average person in even religious life has never experienced the discipline of daily recording himself what he does, what he thinks, and why. If he did this, you would discover that life as we live it every day is far more educational and beneficial than we are inclined to suspect. We think of life as just a series of events through which we pass and we do the best we can, and we hope we last to the end of the month. But this is not really living. The individual who lives without purpose and uh, does not make some personal unfoldment as the result of life is missing the opportunity which nature has provided. We are here for a reason, and that reason is not merely to ignore the laws of living. We are not here to do as we please in a universe that is ruled by an orderly procedure. Our real reason for being here is to discipline ourselves and keep harmony with the principles of our own existence. We are here to grow, and growth means to give proper attention uh, to the needs of the self. Now, growth is not the result of catering to self. Growth is not the result of recording only what we want to think nicely about. It is not intended to cause us to be self-obsessed or fixed in such attitudes. Rather, it is a reason why we should not make mistakes that we make every day. We should not allow pressures within ourselves, undisciplined attitudes, mistakes that may go all the way back to childhood and infancy, to continue to plague our patterns of living. Every once in a while we get a chronic example of this in a problem of a person who has had several marriages, perhaps three or four marriages. Now, if this person had kept an exact record of their relationships and their attitudes through these four sessions, they would have learned a number of valuable things about themselves and why their relationships with others failed. Rather, they simply took the attitude that the marriage partner was impossible and started out and tried again. It never occurred to them that they were the one that was impossible. And they will never believe it unless there is written a record and a proper amount of witnesses and perhaps have the thing notarized. This, there's got to be some proof that the individual is wrong. And the only way he can get that proof is by being honest. And the only power that keeps him honest, for the most part, is a continual revelation of his own ineptitudes, <laughs> constantly facing his own mistakes, realizing that they are his, and that no matter how much other people try to please him, they will never be able to save him from the consequences of his own wrong attitudes. So if we start in with some kind of a regular recording procedure, we can begin to discover the weaknesses in our own thinking. Many people are what we might term quick thinkers. They go from one thought to another very rapidly without giving weight uh, to the attitude that they are holding. Prejudice is a very common form of this. And a prejudiced person will remain so till the end of his life unless he records the prejudice. If at the first time he develops a prejudice, he writes down what he did not like and why he did not like it in this particular person. 
he will then go along and pretty soon he comes across someone else and he has the same attitude again. And gradually he comes to find out by careful thinking that this prejudice is in himself. If he keeps his records correctly, he will also discover that he has lost something by being falsely prejudiced. He has lost opportunities to grow. In many cases, he loses a job. In some instances, he breaks a home. But gradually, his prejudice is forced upon him for consideration if he writes it down. If, therefore, he begins to write a biography of a prejudice and includes this in his records of his own life, he may in due time outgrow this by discovering the fallacy of it. He will also occasionally find a person against whom he was prejudiced turns out to be a very good and sincere friend. This should not be allowed to just drift by with no one paying any attention to it. We should never dislike a person and then suddenly like them and not know why. All of these changes of moods, all of these reactions to circumstances should be duly and properly noted so that the person can go back over a day, a month, or a year and try to discover, if possible, what he has gained from a series of incidents which, for the most part, he might pay, uh, pass over without a second thought. Also, he can keep record of his preferences. He can keep track of the number of hours he spent in front of a television. He can keep track of the... Uh, programs that he turns on, and those he does not turn on. He can examine himself to find out, if possible, why he is particularly uh, appealing, appealed to by crime pictures or by sports or by research projects. He will start learn something about himself. And when he gets through watching a program, he should be able to say to himself, what has this done that in some way increases or improves my own consciousness? What have I learned that is helping me to grow, to become a better person? Have I a secret tendency to turn the program off, but rather let it run through? All of these actions bear witness to character specifications and specialties, and we have a right to understand them. These characteristics all add up over a period of 60, 70, 80 years into a lifetime. And a lifetime that is lived on the basis of attitudes that cannot be sustained, that are not reasonable, that are not factual, and that add nothing to the positive growth of the individual. If we uh, miss all the opportunities to be better, wiser, and more thoughtful, then life as an experience is an almost complete failure. We are here to learn, not to dawdle our way through the years. We are here to find out how to be better and to do better and to understand more and dedicate more of ourselves to common good. If none of these elements are encouraged or nourished and we do not even realize that we are wasting a lifetime, then it is our own loss. And only a record can be made to show what these processes really are. One problem is to observe the warrior. Now, the warrior constitutes a person for whom a complete column in such a record should be set up to find out how many times that individual has worried about something that never happened worried or feared that which, when it occurred, was not difficult at all, worried about other people when these other people had no interest in this uh, effort of their friend. People that we are worrying about are probably also worrying about us, and uh, we know that they need our help, but we, they, we do not realize that we need their help. We have to learn these things. And writing it down, underscoring it, comparing the situation on Monday with the consequences on Tuesday, day by day, uh, monitoring conduct can be a very important experience. Now, most people are not much interested in building a great big book in the course of a few months of all their peculiarities. 
Therefore, we can use a sampling process. We do not need to write down everything. But we can take two or three areas in which we know we are in trouble most of the time. Where is this lack of patience, lack of insight, lack of kindness. That in one way or another we are spoiling chances. And we are failing in the experience of becoming better every day. And the thing that is preventing this improvement is a series of negative patterns in our own minds. Therefore, we can take three or four distinct difficulties which have been allowed to increase over a long period of time, which we have perhaps burdened ourselves with since childhood, and we can gradually weed them out, discover the fallacy and uselessness of them that all this worrying put together has not done one thing to advance our insights unless we learn how to stop worrying. Now, worrying is something that is natural to human beings. Even we find evidences of it in the animal kingdom. But worry is a misuse of energy. And uh, as m many of the ancient scholars pointed out, everything that is important in life is worthy of deep and careful consideration. But nothing should be handled by fretting and fussing. Everything that comes along as a problem should be solved in the spirit of internal enlightenment. We should always be living the best that we are and the best that we know. And if we do this and come against a complicated problem, then we have inner resources which will help us to find a new solution to a new problem because of the general attitude that we are holding. Little by little, therefore, we correct old faults, build new strengths, and become more useful to ourselves and those around us. So this record is something that is well worth bearing in mind. Another record type of thing was uh, developed in Egypt. And in this particular type of record, uh, the individual who began a study, for instance, a person who intended to become a physician, or intended to become a priest in the temple, or intended to become a builder of palaces or houses. This individual, in his instructional period, studied usually with the masters of his arts or sciences. And when he was ready for his graduation, he was supposed to prepare a paper, a dissertation, the idea of the dissertation has continued to annoy young people now. A dissertation is usually a headache. And a, a doctoral thesis is enough to cause a person to collapse in one way or another. Because it is meaningless. It tells nothing that is real. But the idea behind it in the first place was really a very good one. This dissertation should be a simple statement on the part of the graduate, of how he wanted to use what he had learned for the common benefit of mankind. He was so supposed to explain how he would proceed, if he was to build a school, if he was to create a group of people, if he was to perform some public service, that his knowledge was to be dedicated to the help of all living things. And he was going to explain in his case how he actually intended to do this. What his steps would be, one, two, three. How he would proceed after graduation to make the education he had received valuable to others. This habit of preparing these outlines should be revised and revived. It should come down to us that education is an asset which must be dedicated. It must be given to the source of all need for the advancement of the, and enrichment of all good in nature. Otherwise, its primary purpose has failed. So here's another problem of how the individual is going to take what he knows and use it. Now, perhaps you may decide that he is going to take what he knows for further research, that he has found a problem that others haven't solved, and to this he will dedicate his life if it is useful and necessary. So he has a, pl a project and a plan which he is expected to fulfill. 
and if he varies from this plan or fails to uh, fulfill it, he is subject to criticism and condemnation not only by his own teachers but by society in general. Another interesting phase of keeping records you probably have observed in TV programs. Uh, you find an archaeologist out in the field working in a mud hole or, or an old wall or something. But if he has a pick in one hand, he has a pencil and paper in the other. Every single thing he finds out he's writing down. Every step of his discoveries, every inch of soil that he has turned is noted. Where and how the artifacts were accumulated is carefully recorded. Or out in the field, someone is studying animal life. They also are watching the animal very uh, carefully, but they have a paper and pad and pencil with them. They have watched and studied the habits of these various animals and have recorded them accurately in order that it's science and uh, ecology in general might be of greater service to the preservation of various forms of life. Now, what we really need most of all sometimes is that pad and pencil to discover the eccentricities of ourselves. We must discover which layer of what we are functioning in and what we have dug out of our own subconscious. And if it is no good, we should analyze it away, understand it, and realize why it is worthless to us. All this careful self-estimation, however, has to avoid one danger, and that is excessive self-centeredness. The individual who is just self-centered and is doing all this simply because he wants to be a more arrogant or successful or is concerned primarily with financial improvement, this is a failure. But if he is honest in the recording of his own attitudes, it will in many instances demonstrate to him why the search for fame or the search for wealth is a delusion. But as long as he believes in it, he will suffer for it. And until he records day by day the incidents leading up to accumulation and later do the uh, scattering or disseminating of that which he has accumulated, until these facts are clear, he is not in possession of the real, essential knowledge he needs. He can be warned and told by every counselor in the country that he should change his ways. But unless there are facts that cannot be denied by his own mind, he will probably continue in his present course. But when these things that happen on his own skin are brought home to him by thoughtfulness, and he realizes again and again what he is doing to himself, then gradually facts can take over. And facts come in as a useful way of pointing out a mistake. And where the mistakes are reduced, the life of the individual is markedly improved. Also, there are areas in which the person should note for instance, the ability to carry responsibility. Is the individual by nature very thoughtful, very careful, very skillful in problems re uh, resulting from or involving accepting responsibilities? The individual should realize his depth and his limitations in this area. He should realize that he must have certain qualities of dedication if he is to be a truly responsible person. If he is careless in these matters, losses result, and the individual does not accept the experience, he keeps right on making trouble and sometimes gets himself into desperately difficult circumstances. Every phase of life must be made reasonable, must be made according to natural reason and natural law. The law of cause and effect is just about immutable. And in the common experiences of living, every generation has gone through the tribulation of setting in motion causes, but not being willing to accept the results. If, therefore, the individual through experience recorded in his own life sees the necessity of accepting the responsibility for the actions which he commits, 
he will then begin to observe those actions which he can live with and those which are too destructive to continue. This is a problem in your alcoholic. It is a problem with narcotics. It is a problem with uh, various drug addictions. The individual has not willingly or consciously accepted the inevitable evidence of the trouble he is making for himself. He is not saying, is it worth it, and deciding it is not. He goes along from day to day, and by gradually weakening his mental resources <coughs> by the abuse of them, he comes finally to be a hopeless addict to something. And this, by this time, he, he may claim not to be able to change the situation. One other problem which uh, we also can classify is the energy use problem. We have within ourselves a, an energizing capacity. We are able to do things. We are able to explain and study and think and act. We can take long walks, climb mountains, and do all kinds of things by the energy within ourselves. Now, energy is useless to the individual unless it is channeled. The individual who has energy does not have an inexhaustible supply. This is a point that many people overlook. Young people do not realize that in years ahead their energy resources will be depleted. The, end, the use of energy is one of the heaviest responsibilities that we have to bear. And energy is the most priceless factor we have in the maintaining of a program of personal growth. Therefore, energy means that we cannot afford to waste the life in ourselves on foolish, stupid, or unreasonable attitudes. Energy must be used constructively. Any energy that is used destructively is a loss, and it also is the cause of consequences. The individual who gets angry is setting something in motion, the results of which he may not be able to control. Yet he will say to himself that he cannot control the anger. He must do whatever he feels like doing at the moment. But if he keeps a record of his feelings day by day, and what he does about them, and how he continues to maintain them at all costs, he will in the course of six months develop quite a dossier as to why he shouldn't do it that way. He will begin to see that he is wasting life, misusing energy, and deducting from his resources without gaining anything. Something that does no good is almost as bad as something that does evil. Because we are not here to do nothing. We are here to grow and to live and to share. We are here to fulfill the destiny for which man as a creature was created. And we cannot do this unless we gradually gain control of this instrument, which is ourselves. We have to learn how to become skillful. If you buy an expensive computer, you take lessons on how to use it. Well, the individual's inner life is a living computer, far more important, far more valuable, and more irreplaceable than any computer for which we can uh, turn to which we can turn for adding up bills or chemical formulas or whatever it may be. Actually, the computer which is ourselves uh, has to be brought under the control of training. You have to take a course to run a computer to do the bookkeeping. You have to learn every art and skill that you expect to use. If you expect to be a musician, you must sacrifice a great deal of time and energy to mastering the technique. The same is true of the artist. The uh, doctor spends years uh, in training. Uh, the physician, the lawyer, the banker, all these require either long legal trainings or uh, ap apprenticeships in uh, f the fields of their choices. This type of thing reminds us that we must take a course in running our own lives. If we don't, we're, not, we're going to run them into the ground. If we do not do something to make sure that we are using our energy allotments satisfactorily, 
if we do not find out in course of time that the brain is, re is a responsible organ in our lives, if we cannot justify the attitudes of our own minds or cannot control and direct and improve the level of our emotional attitudes, then we probably are also having a bad time with the body and everything is going to pieces because nobody is running the show. Now, we can say that uh, the willful person thinks he's running the show. He, he wants to do what he wants to do, and that's it. But if it so happens that what he wants to do is destructive, it must inevitably end in disaster. Or if he is one of these labor-saving individuals who wishes to get along in the world and amount to something but has no interest in hard work, this also represents an inconsistency which can best be detected by putting it down in black and white. In other words, we've got to honestly understand ourselves. We've got to realize that under certain conditions we are most likely to make a mistake, and that in most instances the mistake is due to intensities, prejudices, or ignorance. Therefore, we have to get over these particular problems. If we are confronted in life with a series of problems in a certain field, it becomes extremely important for the individual to gain all possible knowledge and insight concerning that field. If we want to use the universal knowledge of nature wisely, we have to find out how to apply it to the special problems of daily living. Now, some people feel that it's a waste of time uh, to find out the answers to problems which perhaps do not bother them. On the other hand, those same problems may bother, the, bother their children, their parents, uh, their marital partner, or, they, or their friends and neighbors, so that they become addicted to passing on recommendations which do not arise from knowledge, but come off the top of the head as the feelings of the moment. Therefore, anyone who wants to help others must learn how other people's problems can be faced. Platitudes have never been very successful. Even the idea of positive thinking, while it's important, is not important unless it is backed up by something. The positive thinker must also have a positive inner consciousness of what is happening must learn in one way or another to become a valuable source of good for other people. If we are not a valuable source of good to others, we will probably be a valuable source of trouble. We will be constantly uh, developing new problems for the people who turn to us for help. So in the uh, problem of working with these situations, we have to keep the records. These records are like the history of an organization. They are the autobiographies of attitudes. They are the history of ourselves. And uh, as, as though we were planets, or as though they were, were infinite forms in nature, that the individual is like a solar system, that he is like all of the cosmic world around him. He has his history, he has his laws, he has his reasons and its principles. And he, as an individual, is at the moment the ruler of his own life. And uh, this is a responsibility, a responsibility heavier than many people want to bear. But we have to gradually become the real ruler of our own lives. Now, in the doing that, the mystics and people of this thought have decided that the best way to be a ruler of our own lives is to keep the laws and principles of the great spiritual traditions which we believe. The average individual is not going to be a great scientist in these matters, but he can and will have as a resource, and we all have, the traditional integrities of our race. From the very beginning of our time, we have known certain people whose conduct we admire. They were the unselfish ones, they were the dedicated people, Many of them were martyrs. A great many of them went unknown and unrecognized down the corridors of time, but have gradually emerged because of their integrities. So down underneath everything, the average human be being believes in an integrity of some kind. 
Now the problem is to apply it to himself, that he will learn not only from his own experience, but from the compound experience of his race, of his generation, and of the very world to which he belongs. All of these lessons are available to us, but sometimes we don't even want to bother to look for them. It becomes too involved. And furthermore, we have a sneaky suspicion that if we found out what was right, it would frustrate us, us considerably in our daily conduct. We would not be able to do with good spirit the things that we should not do, and uh, our life would develop frustrations. Nature doesn't want anybody to be frustrated. Frustration is really an interference with the natural flow of life. A frustration is an individual who is cutting off something that he probably should develop, mature, and learn to use. Frustrations, therefore, benefit very little and are things that should be overcome. Another thing that we face, and which, of course, comes down to us from the past, is the tendency of the idealist or the person who wants to grow to isolate himself. This, in, in my feelings, would be the supreme selfishness. We are not supposed to isolate ourselves and try to be better than other people. What we are supposed to do is examine ourselves and find out how we can become more useful to other people. It isn't a case of gaining all this for ourselves. It's a purpose of becoming better pens in the hand of a ready writer. We want to be servants of realities, servants of truth. We want to be helpful, good Samaritans, and all these things. But this can only happen when the individual improves himself. To put himself in a condition where he rejects learning, where he goes off by himself to be free from temptation, he becomes weaker and weaker and gradually loses the benefit of this life and usually has to come back again and do it over because he has simply refused to accept the reason for his own existence. If, however, the person feels that in discipline there are certain experiences that are necessary to him, then perhaps for short periods of time for his own growth he may require solitude or isolation or retirement but, but this is a temporary thing, only to give him the courage and strength to go on with his major commitments. The major commitments, therefore, are at the top of the pad when you write this book about your own life. What are you trying to do? What do you believe is worthwhile in your life? And many people will take the attitude that they are not sufficiently in in influential, they're not enough uh, informed to really do much of anything. All they can do is the little small things around the house or whatever is natural to them. This, again, is a mistake because while it is may well be true that they are not available for heroic decisions, the individual, no matter what condition he finds himself in, is in a position to plan growth, to plan a future, to plan even small things which are going to occur to him in his daily living. Every individual, for instance, has to plan his own retirement or plan how he will use those years of life in which his physical activities are likely to be restricted. He must plan for this type of thing. He does not want to wake up sometime and find himself dumped into a retirement situation in which he has nothing to live with and nothing to live for. He should begin at the beginning of life to plan a useful way of life. Every individual should have a column in his book as to what he is going to do to make things better for the world in which he lives. How he is going to, in small ways at least, be a sincere example of integrities. Sometimes the best thing the individual can do is to live a good, quiet, uh, cheerful, useful Christian life. This may be the fulfillment but there can be a great ministry arise from this. The well-adjusted, conscientious, dedicated person is an example which can lead many others to the strengthening of their own characters. Therefore, no good deed is ever lost. No good effort is ever without its proper consequences. But very often these consequences are not what we want. 
Sometimes we think a good deed ought to result in an indebtedness in which we can lean on these people for the rest of their lives and ours. This is not the answer. But where a truly dedicated life meets its burdens, responsibilities, and changes of existence with dignity, with simplicity, and with the prevailing natural optimism, there is something much to be said that such a plan can be made to work. It can be made more and more workable in a situation in which many people are living today much longer than their forebears did. With an expectancy today of at least 80 years, and very possible 85 or 90, the individual should very definitely not retire from the human race when he retires from work. He should not give up all of the purposes of life. He should rather discover new and more important ways of contributing to others and advancing self in understanding and insight. Now, everyone needs to know a little more than they do, although some won't admit it. And in, left, in uh, trying to find out things, uh, there are certain areas of knowledge in which it is very useful uh, to share the experiences of others. And always in this world, in its present complicated condition, the experiences of other people for woe or weal can be uh, observed. We can learn certain things from the experiences of others as well as from our own. Or we can find out that we are right or wrong or come at least into certain certainties or uncertainties by comparing our experiences with those of our associates. Therefore, a sharing of experience is very useful. But this is not a sharing of opinions. It is a sharing of the experiences that can be justified and proven as factual. And by gaining the benefits of experiences in fields which are not our own, we gain a larger and broader uh, approach to life. A clergyman or a teacher or an instructor in religious matters cannot hope to be perfectly informed on all the problems that a congregation or a student body may bring to him. He cannot have been through every type of experience. He might like to hope that he may have a grand key which he can apply to all types of experience, but very few have succeeded in this, actually, because there has to be a certain factual relationship between the person and a circumstance before he can be an authority on it. But the people who come expect help and need it. So the only recourse under such conditions is to find out from those who have specialized in other fields uh, the best available information that can be passed on to this particular person in trouble. It's safe to say that in the course of a ministry of 25 or 50 years, the individual, the teacher, will be required to bring some type of consolation or insight to persons of hundreds of different characteristics, different characters, different relationships with life, different races, different nationalities, different religious denominations, different arts and sciences. All these people, regardless of what they're in, get into trouble. They get into situations which they cannot handle, and they come for help, and they expect to have it. And, of course, in actuality, probably the only thing on earth that can possibly uh, bring answers to all these problems is divinity itself. But to the average practitioner in any field of public service, there is a responsibility to bring the best available information, to give to the per person in trouble that which is the best known solution to his problem. And to do this, we have to continually work with various fields of knowledge. These fields of knowledge do not necessarily become obsessional. We do not have to allow ourselves to fall into a, a slough of despond over the conflicts of knowledge. But we do need, if possible, a working basis to help other people. 
And we cannot assume that these other people will all be benefited by that which is most appealing to ourselves. We have to be prepared to meet these different situations that arise in life. Therefore, it's a good thing sometimes to keep a case book. If you are in public life and are working as a teacher or counselor or in healing or any of these fields, it is very advisable to keep a good, solid record of what has been done to each individual, how they have been worked with, what their problem was originally, and the best information, the best light we could cast upon this subject. Another might do much better, but that we had done the best that we could. Then we have to watch and see what happens. And if we find out in the after time that our advice has not been good, that the individual either could not or did not apply it, then we have to give further thought to the situation. This is quite common now with certain metaphysical organizations. Uh, many of these people get into difficulties, go to the organization and try to get help, and the organization cannot give it to them. The reason why this happens is that the organization has not kept records of the consequences of its own instructions. It has said that this all was an inspired situation, that some divine power was back of the whole thing, and if any even get anyone got into trouble as a result of it, it would have to be considered their own fault. Uh, this is an evasion of fact. The individuals, and I know some who have been in and out of a dozen different movements and organizations, and have gradually come to the in, in simple fact that the person has to determine in his own life and nature what is honorable and what is right. He has to uh, escape from the glamour of promises that can never be fulfilled. In life everywhere, wherever a promise is made, in which there is no contribution on the part of the individual to fulfill the requirements of that promise, there will be trouble. Even then, if the promise was wrong, there will still be trouble. But everywhere we go, we have to gradually change opinions into facts. Heraclitus said, opinionism is a falling sickness of the reason, and this is essentially true. We cannot be expected to solve problems by opinions. Sometimes a person will come to us and say, what is your opinion on this matter? Actually, it's not very much value for anybody's opinion. The answer is, what are the facts? And in order to get the facts, the individual has to wade through the emotional pressure of promises and of various inducements and perhaps most of all the strange dedication to trying to become a god in a short time. All these things have to be removed from the picture. What are the facts? And when it comes to the facts, the pencil and paper are extremely useful because you have to live with it later. You can't say a month later, I didn't say that, which is a very uh, quick way out of a very difficult situation. Or we, I shouldn't have done that to this particular person. Gradually, by controlling the results of our conduct, because of the consequences that they obviously cause, we get to the point where our instruction or information becomes more practically useful, useful and practical. We also have the problem, which are now being emphasized, of physical ailments and the records necessary to understand them. Nearly every doctor who is a reputable physician keeps a constant record on the condition of his patient. He keeps a constant testing of their health situation and advocates periodic examinations. Now, these may be more expensive and unnecessary, but the principle involved is that there must be a recording. The physician must know what is happening to the person. And yet that same individual at home, with no particular physical problem that is noticeable, keeps no record of the happenings which affect his emotional life or his relation with other people or his uh, employment, his recreation, 
his activities, his relaxations, all of these things are just, well, they just happen. He comes home tired out, sits in front of the television with a television dinner, and watches a baseball game. This has, uh, has become a pattern with millions of people. It is estimated at the present time that sports in America have the largest listening or viewing audience that there is, and that almost any evening, out of the 250 million people in the United States, 75 million will be looking at sports. Well, that's all right. Sports are not going to hurt the individual particularly, but they're not going to do him very much good. Sports are all right, but not as a constant, continuous, inevitable way of escaping responsibility. It's pretty difficult to do any intelligent thinking while watching a football game. But uh, it, the individual can divide his time, but he should not consider his life to be caused to be fulfilled by wasting time. He comes home tired, he feels that he has bought the right to do as he pleases in the evening, so he does that which, for instance, is his outlet. But it's because he has nothing else. Somewhere in the life of this individual there should be interests that help to develop and uh, unfold the character and temperament of each person that comes into the world. He should have a constant record of the things that are important that he is accomplishing. It may be that uh, he should take up a language. Perhaps he would find it much more valuable to himself uh, to become an artist or be, be a musician. At least those things are discipline. We may say, of course, that an artist, uh, so what? There are lots of artists. That's true. But every artist has a dedication. He has a dedication of some kind to the performance of a skillful action. He learns the palette. And if he wants to, he will see in the palette the history of the universe. Because the color combinations that he makes are part of a spectrum that originates in the divine life itself. He also learns the mixtures of colors as seen in nature. He discovers one tremendously important thing, namely that the colors he sees with his eyes are not in many cases the true colors at all. Here he is seeing something, as, well, as we might say, with a well-tempered vision instead of the thing as it actually is. Also, the artist has a tremendous potential. He is the only person who can change a landscape any time he wants to. If he doesn't like three trees in a picture, he just eliminates a tree. And he does it without chopping a tree down or hurting anything. All he is doing is fulfilling his own sense of proportion, propriety, harmony, and rhythm. Great artists like Dura, Michelangelo, Leonardo were great mathematicians. They were also great anatomists and physiologists. Uh, they produced inventions in many fields of life. They had a profound study of the human body, and the diagrams and figures of Leonardo da Vinci on the development of the fetus are among the great masterpieces of art and science. So here's an artist who is all things, and in every art, science, trade, craft that the individual takes up, there is an opportunity to share in an infinite wisdom. There is an opportunity to make the thing you are doing a teacher not only of your mind but of your heart and of your soul. All these constructive outlets make people happier and help to make life more important. Therefore, if some time is taken from the wasting of time, then we can also realize that the person will be preparing for a retirement in which the mind will be filled with constructive and hopeful expectations of further opportunities to learn. These are the things that make life important. Muhammad on May always divided his day by the, eight, by the 24 hour rule. Eight hours of work, eight hours of rest, and eight hours of service. The individual has the opportunity to take recreation and make it the basis 
of the most happy and wonderful experience of growth that is imaginable. Recreation is a, a kind of dance of life, as Havelock Ellis called it. It is an opportunity for the individual to have the joy and glory of moving along toward the source of all good and doing it in a, in a happy way. But for some reason or other, we have become of the mind that if it's good for us, it's unpleasant. This is not according to good sense or according to good religion, but it has involved itself in practically every aspect of human growth. To be a growing person, you must be a frustrated one. This is as far from the truth as anything you can imagine. Uh, to be a truly growing person, you must be a completely free person, free from the fallacies of your own attitudes. This does not mean that you go up on the top of a mountain. It doesn't mean that you join some kind of a club of the discontented. It doesn't mean that you are now entitled to use all the uh, cocaine you want. Freedom is the actual wonderful privilege of being right. And because we are right, not having to worry about trying to get over the mistakes to which we have been in service for so many years. All these things can also add up to perhaps another type of literature, and that is to write the book of the thing as it ought to be. You might sometime find it interesting to take yourself as the hero of the world. Now this sounds like audacity right now. This, uh, the individual say, it's never going to happen to me. At least that's what he says, but a lot of them believe it is. Anyway, the idea, however, is, is that you're the hero of a story, and that this story is your own life, and that therefore you're going to write a wonderful play, a wonderful drama, a great book on the a fictionalizing of your own life. You're going to do all kinds of interesting things that you may never factually do, but you're also going to dramatize uh, your own reactions to life. If you love nature, that's going to be in there. If you have a great love for children, that's going to be a leading factor. If you've had an unhappy and frustrated life, you're going to be able to show other people how they can transform these limitations as you believe that you have or certainly are going to try. Little by little, you can move yourself into the person you know you ought to be. You're the person who is kindly to others, tempered in all their attitudes, uh, lives without over-domination of ego, is not much interested in fame or fortune, but is interested in living an unfolding of personal existence toward reality. In other words, to fulfill the reason why we are here. Now, some people will be able to approach this very carefully and very cautiously, very thoughtfully. To others, it'll be simply a general motion. But if it's nothing more than a natural resolution to correct faults one by one, it is a tremendous motion in the right direction. Wherever in writing down your list of peculiarities, you find that you are easily irritated or that you are, have great trouble answering the telephone or, or that you don't like to be uh, the victim of uninvited guests, that all these things you can work through. You can gradually organize the situation so that you can control every phase of it. And whatever comes along, it uh, becomes no interference in anything whatsoever. There are no interruptions, as Zen points out. What we call an interruption is simply a lump in Zen. <laughs> it, is a, it is a small bump somewhere, but it means nothing. And as the Zen master goes along a little further, the bump becomes a koan. And a little while the interruption becomes a key to the improvement of the discipline itself. So we don't uh, anymore have these pressures. One of the rewards, we're trying to get rid of them certainly, one of the rewards is better personal life. A second uh, reward is a greater usefulness to other people and the uh, in for improvement of our characteristics and our temperaments. Another reward is our relationship to the younger generation that is coming up. A generation which is in deadly need, in terrific need, of good example. Uh, the generation that is 
wild, but is more or less following frustrated or wild parents. If they are belonging to peer groups, which are not commendable and very seldom inclined to accept the family itself as the peer group. It goes outside to those who break the rules and become the heroes. Now this type of thing becomes a responsibility for all thoughtful persons. The older generation has, must begin to give a better example to these young people. It must begin to live as it would have those young people live. It would have to gain their confidence. It would have to prove that the parent is thoughtful, reasonable, factual in his recommendations. And if he claims to have ideals, that he is living them or trying to as well as he can. To try to teach a child morality with no intentions of applying the rules to your own nature is one of the reasons why we are in the present condition. Everyone busy doing what they want to do and neglecting what they ought to do. Wherever children appear, they are a responsibility that must be faced, and every effort to avoid that responsibility should be written down in the little black book, because it is something that you are either going to have to correct, or there's going to be a sequel in that book that you're not going to be very happy about. But if the individual observes and can write down the number of times a child's interruption has been rejected, don't bother me now, I'm busy, on how many times the interruption has been accepted and the parent and child have settled down to discuss something of great importance to the child. Well, you can write out these things, you will find the consequences just pile right up. And you can say beyond all doubt that you have actual factual proof that the enlightened and dedicated life is right and is the thing that pays off and will give the person the greatest opportunity to be of service to other people. Nowadays, with the situation as it is, there is a great deal of exploitation in the field of religion. There are a great many organizations that uh, promise what they cannot fulfill or are recognizing the possibility of financial advantage from the confusion and bewilderment of people. In other words, there are thousands, millions of people in the world today who honestly believe, or think they honestly believe, that they can buy salvation. They believe that if they can build a church or put in a stained gas window, they belong to the elect. They believe definitely that they can contribute uh, without contributing anything of themselves. The individual may, out of charity and understanding, contribute to causes. There's no reason why he shouldn't. But there is no way by which a contribution can be assured to be the basis of a, an immediate or reasonably immediate salvation. The individual is saved not by that type of thing, for he's giving the least part of himself. He's giving something he couldn't take with him anyway. He's sometimes giving something he got dishonestly in the first place. But whether he got it honestly or dishonestly, the gift without the giver is bare, says Longful. It is only when the individual's gift is backed by dedication to principles. And today, a great many organizations are not much worried about those dedications. They want the gifts. Well... Some of them are having a hard time, let's face it. But the individual who is expected to help them must have the ability to determine within himself what is right, what is just, and what is worthy of assistance. He must recognize that nothing that is worthy is going to make uh, the path to personal growth a flowery bed of ease. It is going to be troublesome always. It's going to be work. The individual must fight continually against the conspiracy of selfishness within himself. But he can and should realize that he must grow. He cannot be converted into salvation. He cannot be uh, given some kind of a formula and be told he's a member of something and have anything happen unless he makes it happen. 
There is no shortcut to truth. It is a long, hard, difficult road. But it is something that gradually becomes so magnificent in its own nature that regardless of what it costs, the individual would not compromise it even for a moment. But there is that time of getting to that point, the time to compass the uh, entire worldly material that has uh, been burned into us by sorrow and trouble and responsibility. So we think that gradually, taking all these factors together, that the average individual's life is worth a careful documentation. Now, uh, sometimes this happens after they're dead. It's more biographies are written after death than you would shake a stick at. But, you know, there's a fallacy about these biographies. They are really not written to tell about the person. They are written to amuse an audience. In other words, most biographies that we read are more or less... Uh, uh, disillusionments of one kind or another. The individual is downgraded. Now some will say perhaps he isn't downgraded. Perhaps the person uh, who uh, we have regarded as a hero was really much of a scallywag. Well, even that doesn't justify the situation because we all know that people cannot be everything at once. So some people are good and some people are bad. Uh, But those exploitation books that are written simply for sale dramatize situations that may not even be true. But if the time comes later when honesty prevails, we can imagine a biography written after death by somebody who really tried to tell the facts of a case. Perhaps our own little book, that diary, that we have kept down through the years could inspire someone to a great book. A book that would be honest, would tell the troubles and the struggle and the victories, the defeats, the individual bound, bowed down to earth and rising by, uh, victoriously again. It would be a story of an individual groping after realities and dedicated to the finding of them. He may pass out of this life without finding many of them, but he'll find a few. But if his dedication is once established, and the only thing he really wants in this world is to know how to help, how to be useful to the divine plan of things, when he gets into the other life, he he probably will have further opportunities to grow, and he will be rewarded, not necessarily for his achievements, but for his dedications. If he has tried in small ways, he will be better off than those who didn't try in big ways. It is all a matter of growing. And the idea that Pythagoras had in connection with this keeping of records was to make the individual his own teacher. How by little thoughtfulness and by observing the consequences of what we do, we will gradually learn to live better we will gradually find out that when we hurt another, we ultimately hurt ourselves. And as some of the Oriental philosophers have said, when we hurt another, we have hurt ourselves in the other. Because actually, there's only one life anyway. And when we do, do ill to one, we do ill to the source of all. So we try our best to, to do things constructively, And we try to organize our daily life. We can start in by taking a single day and trying to organize it and then seeing what happens. We will find by the second or third day the organization crumbles under the pressure of unusual or unexpected events. But with a little effort we can finally discover that many of these events that have interrupted a pattern can themselves be eliminated and the person can continue the projects of the purposes for which he is dedicated. Another problem that happens that I think is very much in Western religions especially is that the individual who is dedicated uh, nearly always takes on a deadly seriousness. We haven't discovered, apparently, the dance of life. 
we haven't discovered perhaps what some of the older people who were not so smart in some things really discovered, namely that after all, growth is the most joyous process that there is. To grow in wisdom is a magnificent adventure. Uh, growth is not brought about by frustration. It is not the individual turning away from the world. It is the individual who examines the world and finds its own natural beauties that gradually grows. There are many things in the world that we have to uh, consider ser as serious, but there are not so many that we have to react to with too much seriousness. It becomes wrong because growth, the child growing, isn't fighting growth. The people in passing through various stages of life find it's impossible to fight them. All they can do is put them in order and use each period of life as an opportunity for the expression of a great beauty. And it doesn't make any difference whether it is the newborn babe or the centenarian. Beauty is always there. Tremendous values are always there. And the individual who learns to appreciate them does not become uh, an outcast, does not become uh, a cynic. He remains what he always has to be if he wants to grow, and that is ever aware that the mistakes and sorrows and problems of life are all part of the growing pains of human beings. They are there for the individual to transform and transmute by his own consciousness. And there was a belief in antiquity, at least, that no one was ever presented with a problem so great that he couldn't do something about it that it is not necessary to assume that the, our problems are so vast that we cannot solve them. Nor is it our responsibility to take on unsolvable problems and try to solve them. The problem is to grow graciously, to try to find uh, the thing that would make uh, the individual today attractive to the younger generation growing up. That the, the parental attitudes are enlightened that they are gentle, kindly, thoughtful, unselfish, and yet have within them a strength of discipline. Discipline is the most important thing in the world for the average person, and there is nothing they resent more. Discipline is given in the army, and while it is uh, not a very good cause, we'll accept that, very many of those who have gone through army discipline have become much better people as a result they have come out of that discipline with the ability to obey commands, ability to do things that are needed to be done, and to do them without efforts to avoid or evade. But anyway, discipline is the thing that we all have to have. And a, a discipline of a parent for a child must be enlightened. The discipline that we apply to ourselves must be enlightened. We cannot simply blindly uh, swing out at something with an outburst of temper or something of this nature. Discipline has to be gradually gained in the way a musician gains the skill to play an instrument. If he did not practice for years, he could not play it. If the individual doesn't practice self-discipline for years, he will not achieve it. The only way in which some seem to be able to... Uh, shorten this apprenticeship to discipline is through a mystical religious illumination. Some people who have been very worldly, for instance, St. Francis de Assis is one of the examples. A person who has been very worldly and has gradually exhausted the possibilities of excess, who has gradually wasted their ownings or their lives or their health destroyed the relationships with other people and gone on to a very difficult situation. These people occasionally, on rare occasions, but it does happen, suddenly have an inner awakening. They suddenly see, know, and believe the mistakes that they have made. They also seemingly are the ones who were able to remember a combination of circumstances. Remember the details of their own degradation and at the same time remember the details of the universal plan of salvation. In any event, these people suddenly have an internal enlightenment. 
this internal enlightenment is something, as several of them have said in attempting to, attempting to write the explanation, that there is no way of telling what this is. Words completely useless. Uh, those who have it cannot name it, and those who name it haven't got it. Whatever it is, it is a mysterious unfolding of light within their own lives. An, enlight an enlightenment that forever corrects most of the mistakes which they have made. This enlightenment which, in a sense, is a miraculous cleansing of the inside of the cup, where suddenly the individual realizes his true place in the order of things. In the case of St. Francis, we know the story. The story of a tremendous dedication. A story of reaching out towards all things that live. St. Francis pre preaching to the birds. St. Francis representing pain and sorrow as his brothers and sisters. Everything strangely transformed into a mystic ritual of regeneration. A certain story of that, a similar story, is told in St. John of the Cross and many others. But it is a tremendous psychic enlightenment. It is as though a mysterious spiritual bomb had exploded within them and destroyed worldliness. This type of thing doesn't happen to everyone. But it does also come in smaller assignments and arrangements. So against certain retributional prejudices of life, there is this tremendous dynamic change of life. It is real because the individual no longer is capable of doing the wrong things that he did before. He can no longer go back. It isn't a discipline that he imposes upon himself. It isn't something he says, I shouldn't do it. It is something that from the soul of himself he says, I can't do it. And once this becomes a solid thing, that the person can no longer break the rules, because suddenly the rules become the most beautiful things in creation. When this happens, of course, the individual has in a sense transcended the long process of gradual self-discipline. And it is therefore perhaps why sometimes the greater sinner becomes the greatest saint. It is something a revulsion against evil. But we don't always have that. We don't even need it necessarily unless it is next for us. What we really need and what we have to cultivate at all times is this growing realization of the beauty of doing it right. The beauty of no longer permitting the doubts and fears of the personality to interfere with the life of a serene dedication. If we really believe in the divinity that shapes our ends, if we really believe that there is a power beyond our own, a power which is guiding us with love and wisdom forever, we can begin to accept that and we can write in the little book Today I kept it. Today I had a decision to make and I made it right. Then the next day I tried again but didn't do so well. But over a period of time these records will tell us what we are accomplishing. They will also help us to plan a purpose for our own lives that extends perhaps far beyond the boundaries of the present body. It helps to make us citizens of the universe and most of all good citizens. It helps us to become part of that great life which is dedicated to the service of life, to the service of realities, to the service of the divine essence, the divine substance that has been built into us and which we are able to witness. In other words, it is the divine power coming through so that we all become manifestations of the infinite goodness and the infinite love that protects all things. If we begin to feel that way and think that way, uh, little problems will fall away and gradually larger problems will be modified. And if we keep records of what happens when we do it right, 
we will gradually realize that it is not very profitable to do it wrong. Well, that's all for today, folks.